constantly. I'm glad that didn't get on. <laughs> yeah, even in, in meetings, like I, I'll never forget one time he was eating a salad, but he didn't have a fork in a meeting. <laughs> That's unfortunate to not to, to realize that during a meeting, but to be yeah. starving at the same time, you know? Yeah. yeah. What did he do? He ate it as it best he could. Yep. Awesome. That's awesome. Same with grapes and cheese and apples. Yeah, healthy food, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Don't know what it is. <laughs> Stuff will so, power. Jeff, I will leave it to you when we get going. We have 20 yeah. folks uh, who, who gathered now. I don't know if you want to give it another minute or two. Um, I don't think so. I suspect, uh, and I'll, no, sorry, let me just take a quick look through the uh, participant list and see who's here. Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Jeff Leeper. I'm the city councillor. I suspect that I've um, chatted with or met most of you who are here this evening. Uh, we are taking another look at the Loretta Bayswater uh, development. Uh, just in terms of where we are, and actually uh, Fiona may uh, be in a position to sort of describe the process, but um, we have plast plast we have passed a secondary plan for um, this area that contemplates buildings of this height so i anticipate that the zoning amendment um, will likely pass now that we have the uh, supporting policy in place uh, but we are adding on now the the site plan to the discussion um, so i know some of you have sent me some good feedback already on the the specifics of the proposal i promise to take a look at that uh, within the next couple of days and, and start talking about you know the the, the finer details of this project um, but what I'll do is I'll just ask um, Fiona to uh, to take it from here and introduce um, the city team and, and all that good stuff. Perfect thanks Jeff and, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. So as Jeff said we're here to discuss the site plan associated with um, the Gladstone Loretta application um, and very shortly, the team will, will run through um, a presentation, which will show more details. And after I'm done speaking, I will throw in the DevOps link to that site plan application. Um, I did want to spend a moment of time. For those who have been following this file for a long time, uh, you'll remember that Anne O'Connor was the city lead on that file. She's away for Matt Lieb, and then Simon Diaco was taking it. And now it's currently under Andrew McCreet, who is here tonight, but shortly Allison Hamlin, who is also here tonight, will be taking the file. Don't worry if you've emailed Ann, Simon, Andrew, or Allison, the comments will all end up uh, with the right person eventually. You will want to follow this meeting up, uh, should you uh, feel strongly, with sending comments to either Andrew or Allison. Uh, and we'll put the, those email addresses in the chat as well. And uh, any comments that you send, just make sure to CC us so that we can see them as well. But if you've already emailed Simon, don't worry about it. He's, he's sending those to the right people. So don't stress too much. Uh, very shortly, uh, the applicants team will introduce themselves. And like I said, go through a brief presentation on the site plan. After that, we'll open it up into Q&A. If you are on a desktop, You'll want to put your cursor towards the bottom of your screen and there's a Q&A button. You'll want to click that and you'll type your questions into there. Not everyone will see them at first. I will then read through them sequentially and thematically as much as possible. I'll read them out loud and I'll get the most appropriate person to be answering them. Uh, and then they'll be click this and they'll move into another panel. You'll notice the chat is disabled. I can send you guys some info but you can't chat back to us. So if there's anything really pressing, like if you have any technology questions um, or something about like the actual webinar happening, put it in the Q&A and that's how you can communicate with me. And also the other PSA is uh, we are recording this session. It will go on YouTube um, afterwards and um, you can circulate that to anyone who maybe missed this meeting and wants this information. Um, oh, perfect. Someone has, okay. Never mind. Oh, it's okay. Anyway, sorry. I'm confused. That's fine. Um, we'll show how the Q&A works uh, once that moves forward. Uh, mm. Recording going on YouTube. I think that's all I'm going to say. I will just reiterate again. This is the site plan uh, application that we're reviewing. As Jeff mentioned, the zoning is to come and is a separate application. So. Um, 
uh, for to be time sensitive, I'm going to try and avoid questions that pertain to the, the zoning in particular. Um, and if there's any confusion about that, we'll sort that out as we go. And with that, uh, Jeff's going to eat a sub, and I'm going to turn it over to the applicants team. Um, I'm not sure who's best to, to kick things off, so I'll, I'll let someone take it from there. Sure, I can certainly take it from there. So Scott, you want to share your screen for me, please? Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to thank you for taking the time out of your evening to join us tonight. My name is Josie Tavares, and I'm joined here today with my colleague, Jen Morrison. Hi. We are here on behalf of the ownership group. I also wanted to thank Councillor Leeper and Fiona for giving us the opportunity to walk through some of the updates that have been made to our application since the last engagement with the community. This project has been refined as we continue to work through the planning process. The last public engagement for this project was held in February 2019, and that was by the original owners of the property, which was Trinity Developments. Since then, Trinity has sold their portion of the ownership to CLV Group and PBC Group, who now form the ownership group. As such, we're meeting again today to walk through the updates that have been made to the plans. These changes have stemmed from community comments, the Heritage Committee, the City, and uh, CLV Group's experience operating multifamily units, and PBC's group experience in construction. Um, with that, uh, I will get to our consultant team and introduce them to you. So with us today, we uh, have our consultant team who present the plans and answer any questions that you may have on the development. Um, so once I call your name, if everyone can just say maybe a very quick hello, um, when I call your name, that would be great. So from FOTEN Planning, we have Scott. Hi there. And Miguel. Evening. From Hoban Architecture, we have Todd. Hello. And Barry. I'm here, thank you. From CSW Landscape, we have Jerry. Hi. And from CGH Transportation, we have Mark. Hi, everyone. So with that, I will pass it on to Scott and Todd, who are going to take you through the presentation and updates that have been made. Thanks, Josie. I'll continue by providing some background on the planning matters of this project. In doing so, I'll summarize the application history, the site context, and the planning framework. Uh, the Councillor's Office has been helpful in providing a bit of the background on the zoning, so I'll try not to repeat too much information. Also, because this is the fourth meeting on this property, I realize some of you are familiar with the, uh, familiar with the proposal, so again, we'll try to uh, keep this brief so we can uh, have more of a discussion with the Q&A. So to provide a bit of background on the site, um, the first, uh, the first proposal was in November 2018 when we submitted the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment. The purpose of these was to establish the, the underlying planning framework to permit the additional height, the mixture of uses, and the concept. The concept itself has changed in some significant ways over the course of our uh, process, and Todd will explain that to you in more detail further in the presentation. So as uh, mentioned, Previously, uh, the official plan has now been amended to support the proposal through the adoption of the Corso Italia secondary plan in March 2021. As also mentioned, the zoning amendment is in late stages and is continuing along the site plan process. The zoning amendment itself um, is uh, to rezone the lands from general industrial to mixed use center. Of course, the industrial uses reflect the current status of the property and the mixed use center zone will uh, essentially allow us to do exactly what's suggested by that and uh, reflect the secondary plan policies in providing uh, pedestrian friendly compact and transit oriented development. Um, the, uh, to, in a word, just to kind of set the stage before uh, we proceed, uh, the proposal is, uh, is uh, reflected in three new residential high-rise towers, um, is expected to have roughly 846 units, uh, 170,000 square feet of office space, and over 21,000 square feet of retail space. The uh, standard bread building, of course, is retained in place, and the building interfaces with Gladstone with a uh, five-story podium, which will have ground floor active uses, 
prominent glazing and direct access from the street. Um, it's immediately adjacent, of course, to the future Gladstone now called Corso Italia station. And of course, uh, as Fiona has mentioned, the site plan control application, that's the subject of this presentation, uh, is intended to determine site specific matters. So that's things like landscape treatment, traffic circulation, pedestrian access, drainage, and some of the finer details. So just giving a, a brief uh, overview of the context here, um, the property at 951 Stone is a retail strip mall in the standard bread building, which is now home to the Enriched Bread Artists Collective. And uh, the bread building itself was designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act in January, 2020. So the, the building itself will be retained and impro improved in terms of restoration as part of this project. Uh, along Loretta Avenue is a, a range of uh, different commercial and arts uses and industrial uses, including a one-story commercial building on the property as well. Um, it's on the north side of Gladstone. Uh, it occupies the entire block between Loretta Avenue and the LRT station to the east. Uh, it has about an area of one hectare, uh, about 95 meters on Gladstone and 150 on Loretta Avenue. As you can see from the image, it's uh, just north of the Highway 417 in an area characterized by light industrial, arts and commercial uses. And uh, as you go westward, it goes into the low rise Hintonburg neighborhood, which consists of a range of uh, low rise uses. Um, as, as you know, Gladstone is an important east-west arterial extending from Parkdale to Elgin. Um, it provides uh, access to the Hintonburg um, neighborhood, West Centertown and Centertown neighborhoods, and is a traditional main street in Centertown. Um, abutting the railway corridor, I just want to briefly speak on this. On the east side is a large vacant parcel, as you can see. As uh, you may already be aware, it's um, planned for development by Ottawa Community Housing as Gladstone Village, and the plan for that is a mixed income master plan community that provides affordable housing and other uses within proximity of the station. And just before I pass it off to Todd, I would like to just give a brief background on the policy. Um, so the site's designated general urban area, that's the top left graphic in this page, and essentially among permitting a broad range of uses and purposes, the general urban area points you to a secondary plan where it applies, as has been mentioned before. In this case, we are under the Corso Italia Station District Secondary Plan. So in that plan, uh, we're designated station area. You can see on the right panel, uh, the property identified there. And station area is essentially envisioned as the highest uh, density and mixture of uses within the range of the Corso Italia station. In the bottom left corner, you can see the height schedule. I'm sorry, it's a little small, but as the councillor has noted, the um, heights that we're proposing are already earmarked. I should note that the, um, the missive that was sent out for this notification has a previous uh, description of the proposal, which suggests a 41 story tower to the south. It's now a 35 story tower and uh, the other towers were reduced as well, which uh, Todd can speak on in a moment. Um, and then the last graphic we have here is the zoning graphic. As I'd mentioned earlier, IG1 just means general industrial, and that's uh, reflective of the existing uses on the site. And as noted, um, though this meeting isn't about the zoning amendment, the zoning will change to reflect what the secondary plan has put forward. Uh, so that's the background on the planning. I'll now pass it over to Todd if he'd like to walk you through some of the more uh, important changes we've made over the process of this application. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. And one more. Oh, and sorry, I had meant to mention this as, as well. Uh, just a little note. This is an older graphic. It's called Corso Italia now, but it just shows the new plan station and the development of Trillium line that as residents of the area are aware, is well underway and, uh, and proceeding currently. And now, Todd, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly touch on um, some of the key uh, refinements to the design that we've been working on since our last public meeting. 
Um, and as I work through uh, the, the key themes, I'll, um, I'll trade off with our landscape architect, Jerry Korsh, who will speak to um, some, of the, some of the public realm and landscape concepts that have been in development as we've worked together on the site. Um, so this is the, the current site plan, and I won't dwell too long on this because I think the, um, the changes are more apparent through the 3D images, but um, a lot of the work that's, that's gone on has, has been finding ways to improve the uh, site plan, both from a public realm perspective and also just circulation and how, how the site will exist within its uh, context from a practical standpoint. A couple key key items that have changed is there was a uh, pre previously two entry points to the uh, parking garage that were essentially accessed directly off of Loretta Ave. Uh, we've worked with CLV to refine that, that circulation pattern. And now um, the, the, there's a single access point to the parking garage and that, that occurs between towers uh, one and two. So the tower on the right hand side of the page and on the center of the page in between those towers and kind of central within the site is the point of access for the uh, parking garage. So what that does is it pulls the it pulls the point of access off of Loretta and there's a bit of a, a laneway buffer between uh, between Loretta Avenue and that point of access. So cars emerging from the, the garage will have that that loop which will, will act as the mediary. Um, it also gives us a little bit more streetscape for um, amenity and retail to be directly on Loretta, which is an advantage. And then there's uh, retained uh, just a small loading area and uh, garbage pickup at the very far north of the site, which is off Loretta, but far less traffic than if it was a point of access for the, um, for the parking garage. Uh, Jerry, do you want to say anything while we've got the plan up or should I move to the, uh, to the 3D images? Well, just a short note, just um, and then you can go on to it. What we're trying to do is make the at grades um, feeling of the site welcome in any direction. We didn't want any blind spots. We wanted people to feel safe uh, coming onto the site, whether it's from uh, Gladstone, Loretta, or in particular along the, the MUP, which goes from the uh, proposed station along what we'll call the back of the building for right now, but between the building and the LRT as a pedestrian corridor that comes into what you can see as the, uh, there's, there's the green space, which is a, a podium level, and that's a public open space. And so we wanted to make sure that there were no it, no one ever felt like they were trapped. Everyone, there's an, an opening in every direction. It meets all the septed requirements and it feels safe. That was one of the key aspects that we were after. So I'll, let's go from there, Scott, or Todd. Yeah. Great, thanks. So this is a, a distant view, um, looking at the site from the Southeast, an aerial view. Um, as Scott mentioned, the, um, the proposal has, in, in the past uh, year or two, we've, we've proposed to reduce the tower heights from their original height, uh, essentially taking five stories off of the tallest two towers. Um, the, the other refinements that have taken place are perhaps visible, more visible close up, but there's been a lot of work done particularly along the streetscape of Gladstone with respect to the, uh, the podium of that South uh, Gladstone building, how it relates to the streetscape of Gladstone, the, the sidewalk experience, and also uh, essentially how it relates to the standard red building. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. So just briefly, this is a comparison of the, the original scheme uh, 3D model that was presented uh, in, in our initial uh, public meeting and a comparison um, in scale to the current proposal. So it's pretty apparent that the towers, their overall height has been reduced. And um, also, um, as I mentioned, that the height of the podium itself has been reduced by a floor. It, it was previously a six-story podium. 
um, and has been reduced to five stories. If you could advance to the next, please. Now this, this slide illustrates the, uh, the alterations to the podium a little bit more closely. So in the dotted white lines, we can see the outline of the, the mass of the previous podium and the sort of the impact of the reduction in size. And so one of the, one of the comments that came to us through our earlier correspondence was that uh, there was concern from the, the heritage perspective that the existing standard bread building, the heritage building was um, <laughs> sort of being dominated by the, the podium in the background, uh, which is um, also clad in, in a, a brick material to be sympathetic to the standard bread building, but it was uh, really quite large for something um, so adjacent. So the reduction of, uh, of a floor from the podium was the first step. Um, we've also uh, increased the setback from the street so that the, the main portion of the podium matches the setback of the standard bread building. So it, it doesn't stick out proud of the standard bread, but is in line with standard bread. And uh, beyond that, the, the top story of the podium, now the fifth story, was additionally set back from the street to further diminish the scale of the, or the perceived scale of the building and, and allow the standard bread building to have a, a, a more prominent position on the site, particularly as you're approaching from the east, um, the standard bread building is a bit of a beacon on the site in its current, in its current position. And uh, we believe it'll, it'll kind of retain that as, as a three, three and four story building that engages the street um, and is, is paired with a podium next door that is uh, far more in keeping with its scale. Um, one, one other, other thing I'll mention quickly about the standard bread building is that we're uh, currently underway on a more focused study um, for this building itself, um, looking at, at um, potential for the renovation of it. As Scott mentioned, the, the building will be renovated and we're starting to look at how that might play out. Um, now we're working with the Heritage Consultant and with the City Heritage team. Uh, one, of the, one of the changes that might be apparent in this rendering is uh, the window pattern of the east wall. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a subtle shift, but previously a larger pattern of windows was proposed. And um, one, of, one of the comments from our Heritage uh, Consultant was to work with the existing patterning of windows. And so that's, that's been updated. And so it, it more closely reflects the, uh, the heritage character of the building with, with the existing pattern. So there will be a clear distinction and differentiation between the, the pattern and the style of the existing standard bread building and the architecture that will be built today so that the, the heritage will be allowed to read very clearly as a, as a heritage piece and as a, a focal point of the site. I'm going to jump in just for a second, Todd, this journey. Yeah. Um, if you're familiar with the site right now, the standard bread, build, ah, the standard bread building um, sits rather low on it, on the face that's uh, looking onto the, the transit way. You roll down into grade. So what we're trying to do is take advantage of that area. And, that, and you can see the transit plaza between where the... Uh, the transitway station will be. We don't have a current design yet from the city on that, but uh, pr approximately in the area where the uh, Hoban label is right now or the brand. But what we wanted to do is create a plaza or a pop that really opens up so that you can enter the standard bread building from that lower level and you don't feel like you're going into a hole. Also, at the same time, join up with the MUP so that you actually don't have to walk around the site to get into the towers or in, into the uh, site. And you can walk along the transit way along the MUP. And if you're familiar with that area, it's very steep right now. We're gonna be taking a lot of the uh, excavated material from the uh, excavation for the parking garage and use that to build up the grade on the MUP 
so that we actually have a situation where we don't, uh, we're not having handicap accessibility issues, everything will be accessible. And uh, we're trying to make this as seamless as possible so that there's no, no backside to the building. That's what we're trying to uh, evoke here. All right, Scott, if you could advance the slide, please. So this is the this is an aerial view at the intersection of Gladstone and Loretta. Uh, so moving moving around to the site from the southwest now. Um, so just just to further what I mentioned before, there's the the podium scale has been has been reduced. It relates to the adjacent context better, um, and and allows for a little bit more separation from the street. So one of the things that we did as a strategy, as a site strategy, when um, looking at, at this reduction to the podium as it relates to Gladstone was, was really a, a transfer of, of area from Gladstone where um, the impact on adjacent context is greatest and to transfer that, uh, that building mass to the center of the site where um, it's it's more internalized on the site and has less of a direct impact on on the broader context and so the podium has been reconfigured now to actually be a, a connected podium that connects the two towers uh, on the right and at the center of the page um, is a connected podium that will be um, designated as, as office space on the upper floors and a combination of uh, retail and amenity space on the ground floor. Um, and, and one other thing I'll mention cycling back to my comments about the site plan is that the um, access for parking is, is between those towers and it's, it's actually an open air um, access that is um, kind of within the center of the podium and um, but it's it's not enclosed it's actually open air at the ground floor and then the podium slips above next slide please so this is illustrating that central courtyard space and a, again a comparison from the original uh, proposal to what's what's um, proposed now um, as jerry mentioned the idea of just kind of opening up the site so that there's no area of the site where you would be um, closed in. Um, so on the top page, you can see that the, the three towers are connected by ground floor linkages that um, were, were really acting as a, as a blockage between the east and west of the site. Um, so what we've done in the reconfigured version is, is actually to create open space in both of those uh, linkages. So on the right hand side, it's it's open at the ground level for uh, loading, for parking access, and for move in, move out. And on the left hand plaza between the the middle and the north tower is the is the larger plaza that that Jerry mentioned. Yeah. The other thing that should be noted is that on the other side of Loretta, there's a sidewalk now where Canada Bank Note is, and on the side of the road that we're on right now is really a, uh, there is no pedestrian way, there's no curbs, there's no sidewalks. So this edge that we're doing will urbanize that edge and there will be sidewalks, pedestrian way, the street, the street edge will be better defined than it is right now. And then the other feature from this view uh, Jerry is the is the plaza that's directly adjacent to Loretta and and the sidewalk you mentioned, which is right. um, another another plaza and park space um, that. Yeah. And so we can we can look at depending upon how the residents feel, how the artists feel, and the uh, some of these areas can be programmed for events, um, and they they're referred to as pop spaces, but uh, there are public open spaces that can be programmed. They're not parks per se, they're not plazas per se, but it's, uh, it's, it's a way of inviting people who live not just in the building, but in the neighborhood 
to uh, come onto the site and tie in with, with whatever's going on, both from the residential component, but from the, uh, the artist community, especially, who are gonna be, uh, for the most part, in the standard bread building. Um, next slide, please. Right, so this um, is just cycled back to the site plan and a comparison uh, again between the old and new. Uh, maybe I'll leave it there for comments on the on the revised uh, design. Those are some of the main uh, the main themes. Um, again, one of the one of the key items being the transfer of of building area from from the Gladstone side of the podium to make it more internal to the site, uh, improving the streetscape experience on Gladstone and improving the relationship to the standard bread building. I also uh, think I forgot to mention that this, the actual separation distance between the main podium and the standard bread building has also been increased. There will be a, a glass link between them, but otherwise the, the bulk of the podium has been further separated from the standard bread building to, to again give it increased, uh, increased prominence. Um, so beyond that, a lot of the work we've been doing uh, with the owners group uh, over the past uh, year has been to uh, really look at the details of, of the site plan, the functionality of the site plan, as well as looking at uh, the unit layouts themselves, which I think is a little bit beyond the scope of our uh, conversation for tonight. But uh, these are ongoing um, pieces of work that are, they're not finished, but they're, they're ongoing and we're continuing to uh, work together on that. Um, so unless, it, unless there's any other comments on design, we can perhaps move on. Another quick illustration of the, uh, the change in overall height from the original proposed uh, 41 stories and a reduction in five stories on the, on the north and the central tower. Yeah, and then just for documentation, we have all of the, the current plans in place. And then there's a series of extra renderings uh, towards the end of the file here. Actually, if you scroll back for a minute, uh, Scott, to the, the north view. It's just a uh, one more. This is just a vantage point that wasn't captured in some of the other renderings, but this is a view looking at the at the project from the north. So the the white building in the foreground is beyond our sight, and uh, just shown as a massing. But um, again, that's it, it. Does a good job at illustrating the relationship to the to the rail line and also the 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 MUP as Jerry was describing and how it connects the future rail station with the proposed plaza um, and, and really creates a, a continuous path of travel for the, for the public from, from the transit station or from the, the MUP in general in, in to and through the site. We're showing the uh, MUP right now uh, ending at Laurel. In other words, it would turn back. Uh, the city might be looking at uh, continuing that MUP along to the north, although it gets very tight uh, with the bridges and everything else. But the, uh, we wanted to have a circulation movement that can get back into the neighborhood um, without actually having to go to Gladstone and using that as a main uh, corridor. So this would be a uh, a multi-use path for either bicyclists or people walking that uh, would would feel safe. But the tie-in is it is it Laurel to the uh, to the transit station. The other thing is when when Todd was going through the the lowering of the podium levels and the buildings themselves. As a landscape architect, the towers don't affect me as much as the lowering of the podium levels because they help to bring everything into a human scale. You don't feel like you're in a wall, in a massive downtown wall. And uh, 
I think, I think the, scale, the scale of bringing those podiums down helps the landscape and helps, uh, helps you feel at, more at ease as you walk next to these buildings and, and engage with them. Thanks, Jerry. Yes, Scott, if you, you could just scroll through, I think there's a couple more images, sure. but um, that would that would kind of cover my comments for the for the design changes, kind of reiterating some of the views we've seen already. I, I think that covers all the all the talking points we had before the Q and A. Unless uh, Jennifer or Josie, if you can think of anything else. Nope, I think you've covered everything. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I'll um, I'll close the screen share so we can kind of uh, uh, use the panel a bit. But um, let me know if we want to bring up other images and show them again, and I'm happy to reshare the presentation. Perfect. Thanks so much. So we have 17 questions in the queue right now. Uh, feel free to keep them coming. Um, sorry, the chat was set up weird. A few questions went to the chat. I'll just ask that you uh, repost them into the Q&A if you don't mind. Just I'm not looking at the chat, unfortunately. I'm a one-man operation over here and it's a lot to look at. So with that, I will go, uh, I'll just start going through the questions. Um, so the first one's a comment. Uh, it is not only the enriched red artists in that building. Please be mindful that there are multiple artist groups affected by this. For example, loft artists, clay works, et cetera. Very fair point, thank you. Next question. Uh, I have a concern that CLV's publicly stated concept of turning the standard bread building back over to artists in a long-term low rent scenario is not reflected in any project documentation application, including plans, TIA, renderings, planning rationale, do not take into consideration the needs of the artists in the building. Previous discussions with the project sponsors and design team about our key functional requirements are not reflected in the design proposal. I'm concerned that there are mixed messages being sent and that artists will use will be used as marketing vehicle, but ultimately will be designed out of a functional space uh, for our requirements. How will the project team engage with artists and which artists or arts groups to ensure maintaining a future viable arts hub. And that came from Sarah in the Gladstone Clay Works. I can take this um, portion of it. So um, developer is certainly working with Councillor Leeper um, and you know some of the artists to determine what that space might look like in the standard red building to ensure that it meets some of those needs and stuff. So um, certainly if there are comments, uh, you should be submitting those to the city. Um, I do want to reiterate, you know, this is going to be provided back to them at an affordable rate. So we are going to be renovating it. Um, they will be involved in the process to ensure that it does meet their needs. Um, and, you know, it's part of, uh, and I know this isn't part of this conversation necessarily, but some of the Section 37 uh, funds that are going to be allotted uh, to the um, provide affordability for the um, artists in this building as well. So I definitely encourage you to um, provide some comments if you do have someone um, in the space and uh, we can continue to have conversations on it. Just quickly from a design standpoint, um, I mentioned it briefly in, in uh, my earlier comments, but um, we've, we've focused a lot on sort of the big picture for the entire site. Um, and, and looking at how it engages with the street, with the broader context. Um, but the, uh, the standard bread building is, is a key component to the site and, and the idea of uh, retaining it as a, as a place for artists is, is also a key part of the vision for the site. And we're, we're now underway, again, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but we're now underway to look at that building in, in more detail um, as, a, as a project in its own right. And so um, colla further collaboration and coordination on how that space will be programmed and how the renovation will 
take shape, it will be forthcoming. Uh, but it, again, it's certainly part of the intent and the vision for the for the project as a whole. And I guess I should probably reiterate too, like it, it, to in, to ensure that it will happen. It's part of the process, and it'll be part of the funds that we're required to provide as the developer. So you know, maybe that's not clear in the application, but it's certainly our intent to make sure that this you know is completed and is part of the project. So I just want to make that clear as well. Um, if I may, uh, just to reiterate, uh, Sarah, and please do give me a call. The um, uh, there's no zoning considerations with respect to an agreement with the artist, uh, no site plan consideration with respect to um, an agreement with the artist. You have a, you know, bluntly speaking, you have a commercial relationship with a landlord uh, and it doesn't come into the zoning. I consider um, ensuring that the space gets turned back over to artists to be one of the key things that we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and to the point of um, Todd and uh, Josie, that will be wrapped up in the Section 37 benefits agreement uh, over which I have fairly significant uh, control in terms of, of what I'll approve or not. Um, but that does tend to come at the very end of the process. So I, I certainly encourage you to uh, give me a call. Um, I know uh, Daniel, I think, is on the uh, call as well. And uh, he's um, uh, he and I have been chatting uh, off and on about this. Uh, but it is my intent um, to support or not this building on the basis of whether or not there is a satisfactory within reason agreement in place with the artists before I vote in favor of it. Um, but strictly speaking, that's not a grounds upon which um, a site plan or a zoning can be determined by council. I know that's, that's probably a lot, so I'm, I'm happy to take it offline and chat with you further about it uh, at your convenience. Thank you. Okay. Will the public green space just highlighted at the rear of the building have an easement or similar? We have seen those promised before, for example, Ashcroft Convent Development on Richmond, where there is a selling point but then does not materialize. I can take this one again, hey. too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Josie. I was just going to add and feel free to continue the point. Um, so this is that multi-use path that's part of the Corso Italia secondary plan. Um, so it's something that the city has envisioned that they want to do. So the developer will be um, constructing it and funding it. So it's certainly something that will, will come to fruition and is uh, part of the approved plans with the city. So Jerry, if you have anything else you'd like to add to that, feel free. Well, it'll be similar to the MUP that runs along the LRT right now from, uh, well, it'll be from Carling Avenue all the way as you, as you go south. And so it'll be built by the developer, eventually taken over by the city as a public, uh, a public pathway system. And so it'll be the city's responsibility to patrol it and maintain it, but it'll be the developer's responsibility to build it. Thank you. The site plan lists 745 residential unit Site plan control application document says 846 residential units. There's also mention of 930 units, uh, apparently on the uh, design brief in the site plan control package. Uh, so let's get some clarification on how many residential units, please. Todd, I think you can take that one. Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the we've been working with uh, CLV to uh, refine the plans. And part of that is, is working through the unit mix and the, the floor plan layout. Um, so it has changed in the, in the highest number quoted. I believe that was the number that reflected the, the initial proposal where the, the two tallest towers were five stories taller than currently proposed. So when the, the floor count was, re was reduced, the number went down. Uh, in the more recent uh, number, I believe it was 740, 750 units that was uh, quoted. At, at that time, um, there was the podium of the third tower. Um, so the first, I believe, four stories of the third tower 
uh, were not being included in the unit count. We were, we were counting the square footage, but it wasn't designated as residential units at the time. Uh, it wasn't clear to the, um, the previous owner how they envisioned using that space. And so uh, we, as I said, recorded it as square footage um, to, be, to be allocated in the future, but it wasn't, it wasn't counted towards the unit mix. Um, so in the, in the latest iteration and through our work with CLV, um, we've since designated uh, those three stories. Uh, so four-story podium, the ground floor is amenity, um, and the second, third, and fourth floor would be now designated as residential units. Uh, this includes um, a few larger units on that floor plate because the floor plate is larger than the upper tower. Um, and I believe that adds about 40 to 50 units to the overall unit mix just on those three floors alone. Um, and then beyond that, um, as I said, we've been working through different iterations of the floor plan layouts, different unit counts come with that. So um, it's, it's still a work in progress. Uh, the number that we have today is by no means a final number, but it's, it's what is reflected in the current proposal. Thank you. Uh, when will demolition begin? I can take that. Um, so right now we're planning if all the stars align and we can certainly work through our approval processes and the planning process. We'd like to start construction in March, 2023. Um, and so construction or the demolition will start just before that. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, where is the exhaust for the parking garage placed? Um, we're still pretty in that early stages of our design, so we haven't gotten to, you know, the detailed design work of the exhaust, but Todd, maybe you can shed some insight. Uh, very briefly, and we don't have our mechanical engineer on the call. Um, so. Just, just to echo Jen, your comment, uh, it's, it's, it's preliminary at this stage, so that hasn't been finalized. What, what I would say is that we, we will be, we've been working with, uh, with Jerry to be sensitive to the, the site plan that's being proposed and so would be working it around the, the featured public space that's being uh, that's being proposed on the sub plan, but in terms of in terms of a final location, we're not there yet. Okay, thank you. As someone who lives in the Ashcroft development in Westboro, Q West, the old convent has been sitting undeveloped for years with no indication of any work getting done. Will the work of the standard bread building be prioritized or sit empty, undeveloped forever as an afterthought? this one too. So um, as I mentioned, we're hoping to start uh, March 2023. And uh, so that would be the first phase. And that would be the uh, towers one and two on the plan, which are the one beside standard red building inside that. Um, so it's planned that it would start right with that as well. Um, can I just quickly add, Fiona, the uh, Ashcroft Convent building, the most recent zoning for the next phase of the Ashcroft building um, is a is a tied in development of the new portion with the old. You can't build the new without restoring and, and tying in the uh, the old section, but we don't know when Ashcroft wants to move ahead with that. They have their uh, their permission, but they cannot build the convent. Uh, or sorry, they cannot build the new portion of that property without restoring. It's it's all one development. Um, I'm hoping that they will get underway soon. City staff do visit the convent um, on some regular basis to ensure that it's not going to fall down. But uh, obviously, we're all kind of nervous about that one. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the POPs is an interesting idea. How is programming and vision to be administered? Maybe the city can take this one, might have a better idea of this. So just jumping in, so POPs, for those of you who don't know, stands for privately owned public space. 
And generally speaking, um, when we have an application that shows those spaces, um, they are publicly accessible, but they're owned and maintained by the developer or, or property management. So I'll jump in on that. Uh, this is Jerry Korish again. In, on other developments where we've had the POPs, what, the way it works really is if there's an event that's going to happen, it's the management group of the, the development. Uh, there's a residential tower, there's everything. And they have, to, they, they have to be the ones who approve an event happening or not. The space will always be open to the public other than let's say you have a fashion show or something. So you might have an event that happens on that space, but the programming of the space will not be by the city. The city can, can request that something happen or a neighborhood group or someone within the building, but ultimately it'll be up to the management group of the, of the property to both run it and to make sure that it, uh, it's well-maintained. That's one of the key issues. So um, the city is a player, but uh, they're not in control per se. They, they can come and make a request. And usually it's, uh, it, everyone works together. May I just ask uh, in terms of um, ensuring its public accessibility into something approaching perpetuity, is that accomplished via a condition of site plan or is it a covenant that's put on the, on the land? If it's, if it's being put forward as a publicly accessible space, publicly or privately owned pub, uh, public space, how do we ensure that three years from now it doesn't get gated off? Councilor, you can uh, you can do that through the site plan agreement um, with conditions that would require pedestrian access easements on title, so that there's legal access from members of the public to enter that space, even though it's on private property. Um, and then, depending on the nature of the design, you can get into more detailed conditions through site plan, such as not having the ability to fence it off, for example. Yeah. Um, it's it's a fine balance between each site and depending on how each POPs is designed, how much level of detail you get into. But the option is there through the site plan agreement. So that's, uh, that's what I was expecting to hear. And uh, uh, I'll be paying close attention to that uh, to ensure that it is truly a, a publicly accessible space. On that issue, that was one of the main reasons why we wanted to get them up to work um, so that the entire site is accessible. In other words, there's no staircases. There's no ways that you can't get onto the site in an easy manner. And uh, so that, that was one of the main things uh, that Todd was showing earlier on. When you went from the old design to the new design, when you come between those towers, that was always a blockage. And we always felt that, that there was something wrong there. And this opens that whole way up. and. Uh, and it's just, it feels much better. It feels more accessible. It is more accessible. Thanks. Sorry, if you want to go ahead. No worries. Okay, where is the garbage pickup? Um, I don't know if we want to pull up the site plan again, but um, I was early, earlier in the presentation, I, I was mentioning the area between towers one and two where um, it's underneath the podium, but it's open air. It's where the um, access to the parking garage is. Right, okay, so um, the parking, the, the garbage pickup is essentially, um, if you move the cursor towards the top of the page, uh, ba basically a little lower, but basically in that, in that uh, back court space, um, that's where it's being suggested for the, for the towers one and two, and then there's a smaller pickup uh, at the north of the project for the for towers uh, tower three. So one of one of the one of the main ideas there uh, with respect to the main pickup between towers one and two was for the um, for the the pickup zone to be as far from the public realm as as possible, and so there's a there's a good pedestrian um, connectivity through the site from the, the MUP where Jerry mentioned through the plaza. And then there's sort of a, 
pedestrian corridor that runs north to south, uh, connecting towers one and tower three. Um, that's sort of the main pedestrian thoroughfare through the site. Um, the uh, one of one of the priorities from a design standpoint in this in this revision was to get the the garbage loading to be well away from from any any area that pedestrian would would feasibly want to travel. Uh, gets it away from the entrances to the to the buildings themselves, and sort of puts it out of out of uh, the main experience of the site. One thing I will mention because there is an adjacency, if you scroll up on the page a little bit so we can see the top, uh, there, there's what looks like an adjacency between that, that open area and the MUP beyond, but it's important to note that there's actually a change in, a change in grade that's almost a, a full story from uh, the upper, sort of the, the loading courtyard um, below the property line or, or to, the, to the west of the property line and then to the east of the property line where the MUP is, is basically a full story lower. It's just a, a function of the natural topography on the site. So it's not, it's not something that would be perceivable from, from the MUP as you're walking by. There would be uh, sort of a, a landscaped uh, buffer and, and a significant change in grade between the public experience of the MUP and the loading zone. Thanks, Todd, for that explanation. Uh, I, I understand why you placed it there, and there's probably not a lot, a, a lot of other options for where it should go. I would just caution you of um, be careful. You're you're saying you're trying to keep it away from the public realm and and from the the towers, but there's a very active cafe that's right adjacent to to that dry aisle that lots of pedestrians use currently. Um, so just important to be cognizant that even before these buildings are up, there's there's lots of uh, public and private realm that's being utilized by the, the residents in the area. Understood. Yeah. Um, okay, so we kind of touched on this. Um, maybe we can just quickly reiterate how many residential apartments and mix of sizes. Todd, do you think you could take that one as well? Uh, yeah, I can. I can. Um, I don't have the, the spreadsheet in front of me, but in general, uh, the the unit sizes range from essentially bachelor units up to three bedroom units. There's a a mix of what we call larger units or family units being two bedrooms, two bedrooms plus den, and three bedrooms. And those those three categories account for I believe just over 40% of the total units on the on the development. It's about 300 and 340 units, I believe. Um, again, this is this is our current number. It's what we're currently working with, but that's uh, where it's where it's been brought to date. So, kind of a, a broad spectrum from from a small bachelor unit that might be around uh, 500 square feet, 550 square feet, up to three bedroom units that would be over a thousand square feet. Sorry, I'm just going to chime in with the, the um, actual numbers. So for two bedrooms and up, there will be 378 units right now as proposed. But of course, we're still tweaking the plans as you know, a result of comments from the city, from the public, and, and that sort of thing. But that's where we're landed right now. Thank you. And on a similar note, how many vehicle parking spaces and bike parking spaces? I have this one written down actually, so I can jump in here. Mark Proctor with CGH Transportation. We wrote the TIA for, uh, for this property. There are 570 vehicle parking stalls proposed and 502 bike parking stalls proposed. Awesome. Sorry, may I just ask, uh, I think I've heard a couple of times uh, in this discussion, TIA. What is a TIA? It's the traffic impact assessment. It's what we used to call a traffic impact study. Um, but then uh, Ottawa created their, their very uh, unique and forward thinking guidelines and also changed the name of our study. But it, it, you could call it a traffic impact study and it would be essentially the same thing. Fantastic. And uh, is that available uh, on the city development application site? It is. It forms part of the uh, site plan application. Fantastic. Fiona, maybe you could 
yeah, whenever, as whenever the, you have a chance. Thanks. As the next question is being answered, I'll, I'll pull it up. Thanks. Um, is the MUP connecting to the proposed Laurel to Laurel pedestrian bridge? I can try and answer this in the study if you have a better answer, of course. Um, it's my understanding that yes, it will. Um, and you know, in the course of Italia secondary plan, they have like a whole stretch that um, is planned for this multi-use pathway. Um, so my understanding is yes. But, but on, on that issue, the, the, the pedestrian bridge will be a city initiative at some point. And at this point, we don't know when the city is going to go ahead with that. And it might be tied in, maybe the councilor would know, uh, it might be tied in with when Gladstone Village is done with the o OCH project and then there's an impetus for it. I, I don't know, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, correct. I think we're gonna begin uh, collecting uh, funds from the various projects that are going in around here to put toward that bridge. Uh, so the, the funding will matter, uh, but the biggest piece of it will be getting Gladstone uh, Village uh, completed as well. Allison or Andrew, do you have any further insight on that or um, is city's intent to build one, but the timing is uncertain. Yeah, that's probably the best way to categorize it, Councillor, is I think there's a variety of, of funding sources, even potentially development charges, I think, are in the conversation. Um, I did loop that question back to Tavi recently, the author of the secondary plan, where that direction comes in, um, because I have active files in the area, and I'm curious myself, and it'll play a role in this conversation as well. Um, so for the purpose of tonight, I don't have the specifics, but I do believe they'll have to pull from a number of funding sources to get that bridge. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, and that does remind me, we do have, um, for the folks watching at home, there is a rep from um, Councillor McKenney's office listening to this call as well, in case you're um, a resident of, of Somerset Ward. So thanks, Alex, for coming. Uh, the new sidewalks and multipath is going to be great for us neighbors. So happy, sorry, great for us neighbors to use. Happy to see it. Looks quite nice. Thank you. Uh, will the MUP be maintained in winter? I, can... I think the city will have to actually answer that question. That's what I was just going to it, it, It'll be a city facility. I would hope that it would be. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to review that through this current site plan application. Um, we always connect with our operations group to understand that if a new MUP is coming online through development, putting it in their portfolio and making sure it meets the maintenance criteria. It depends on really um, the final design or if there's interim MUPs, um, whether it gets maintained or not in the winter. So don't have the answer for that tonight, but it'll be part of this site plan review. Yeah, sorry, and that's a, that's a really good point. Um, Andrew, can you make sure that you're taking a look at the, the design of it to ensure that our equipment can get in there? Because one of the issues we had with the Ashcroft student building is that yeah. they agreed to build a portion of MUP, uh, but it wasn't to a standard that we could plow, and so that each uh, each winter that's uh, that's an issue. Absolutely, Councillor. That's, uh, that's actually precisely the one I was thinking about why I answered that way, because the middle block developed first before the end one, which was unanticipated. But um, from what I've seen on these plans, if there's a connection from Gladstone looping around to Laurel Street, um, that should suffice as an, as an in and out operation for snow clearing vehicles. But through this site plan, Allison and I will reach out to operations to confirm. Thanks. Um, and I, I think it probably goes without saying that the Laurel to Laurel connection um, would be maintained to get folks over as well to the, the well-maintained Trillium path. So for the, for the bridge, uh, yes. Yeah. But again, timing uncertain. Yeah. Thank you. The site plan application provides floor plans for residential towers, but not for the standard bread company building. Can you provide more information on the planned use of the standard bread company building? Portable artist studios, can this be specified in more detail? Yeah, I can I can take that one. So you're certainly correct. That's not available just yet. Um, we're currently uh, doing a study to kind of look at the ways to um, renovate that interior. Um, we're going to be adding new features to it, of course, you know, things like accessibility standards, washroom requirements, um, introduced elevators and that sort of thing. So we're just taking a real closer look at it. 
um, but you know the developer will certainly be you know embracing much of those heritage features that um, are present there now and um, you know have been modified so we're looking to bring it back to sort of its um, some of its original features um, and yes it will be um, affordable artist space as I'd mentioned previously um, we're working with Councillor Lieber and through that section 37 agreement which forms part of our uh, zoning bylaw uh, amendment some of that funds will be allotted to uh, providing affordability to uh, the standard road artists and uh, standard road building and all of the artists that uh, come along with it. Thank you. Uh, a quick comment. Overall, this looks great. Thanks for that. Okay, speaking on behalf of CBN, which is Canada Banknote, we understand the proponent is aware of CBN's main concerns on the matter of noise and PPS compliance. But for site plan matters specifically, can you comment on how the proposal address addresses the concern about the existing loading and truck movements that occur on the east side of the Canada Banknote facility? Both the movement and turning radius as well as noise given the 24-7 operation of Banknote. So right now um, we are currently underway the appropriate noise studies that are required um, and we are uh, in conversations uh, to ensure that you know whatever appropriate mitigative measures are put in place um, and so uh, yeah we'll be looking to ensure that whatever recommendations come out of our noise study that's currently underway. Mark maybe you can speak a little bit about the turning movements. Yeah, so our site has been, or sorry, the subject site has been uh, designed to allow truck movements, both loading and garbage, to enter and exit the site without interfering with any of the adjacent developments. Um, I, I would assume, though, that what, uh, what the question is relating to is uh, the CBN using the subject site for their truck movements uh, to the east of Loretta. Um, at the time that their site plan was developed, their access should have been designed to allow those truck movements to occur from the public right of way to the access. Um, so that should still be the case and they should be able to use the right of way to, uh, to make their turning movements into or out of their existing access. Okay, thank you. What is the projected vehicles in and out at peak hours, AM and PM? I also have the answer for this one. I wrote. I looked ahead. I had a preview. <laughs> so I wrote this down. So uh, this comes from our TIA. So based on the, uh, the projected mode shares for the site, uh, our traffic study estimates there'd be 116 AM vehicle trips. And that's two-way trips. So that'd be split roughly evenly between in and out. And then in the PM, we would uh, project 125 vehicle trips. Again, two-way, split roughly evenly between uh, in and out. Thank you. Okay, so we've uh, we've answered this, but in case the person... Sorry, just one second. There we go. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. Okay, so we've we've kind of spoken about this before, um, but just in case someone came in late, uh, who will manage these pop spaces, both in terms of maintenance and programming coordination? Can we just go over that very quickly again, please? This is just quickly answered as the landlord. Okay. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, standard bread. How do you determine how many studios will be built and their rental costs? How do you also determine who gets priority to rent those spaces when multiple groups have a stake in this? I can I can take that one. So um, we're still working on the study as, as Josie mentioned uh, earlier. So we're discussing how to allocate the space um, and we will work with the city in determining the selection and rent guidelines. Thank you. We have a, a few questions in a row about the standard bread building. Um, so what does the standard bread building look like? I have not seen it in any renderings. We actually have one rendering that shows the back of the building. Uh, I can put it on the screen if everyone would like. Sure, that'd be great. And while you're pulling that up, 
Um, has the city of Ottawa considered taking over the standard bread building as part of their studio rental program? This brings an arm's length and juried approach as to who gets these spaces. That's really interesting. Um, I don't know the extent to which, uh, you know, as we've been talking about putting the section 37 money from this project into the standard bread building, the discussion has largely been around offering um, existing tenants some level of um, guaranteed rent that is affordable for, you know, uh, 20 years or, or however long that is. Can I take that one away? I, I don't know who's asked the question. Sorry, let me, um, anonymous attendee. Okay. Um, that's an interesting suggestion. It hasn't come up yet. It would depend on whether or not the um, owner wants to work with the city on that and whether the city considers that it has the resources internally to manage the space. It wouldn't be entirely new for the city to do Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. It's very intriguing. Drop me a line. Um, I, I don't know if the if the if the owner wants to react to that um, uh, as well. Uh, yeah, Councillor Lieber, if you, if your office wants to reach out to ours, and once you've had a chance to speak to the city, we can definitely have conversations. Let me uh, let me talk to city uh, the city arts folks. Okay, and on the EBA note, um, will there be an application under the Heritage Act for alterations slash renovations for the standard bread building? Yes, as this building is designated, we will have to apply for it. Yeah, I'll also add um, the, the nature of those heritage applications is they're on a strict 90-day uh, timeline, I believe it is. So it's usually something that uh, comes towards the end of the process once uh, it's understood that approval of uh, whatever the project looks like at the time is imminent. Okay, a uh, traffic question. The development will add 500 plus cars onto Gladstone, Bayswater and Loretta. Do the traffic assessment take into account the other developments in this area, specifically 1051 Somerset and Gladstone Village? So it seems like an obvious one for me again. Uh, so the just a, a point of clarification. While we have proposed uh, a little over 500, or sorry, 570 parking stalls, um, that doesn't directly translate into 500 cars onto the adjacent road network. Those uh, parking stalls are provided. I'm assuming, anyways, that's where the 500 number is coming from. I apologize if, if I'm misinterpreting the comment. That's that's my understanding of it right now. Um, those are primarily provided for residents to have a, a place to store a vehicle for use for uh, weekend or off peak trips, you know, recreational purposes, going skiing, uh, visiting family, going to Home Depot, anything of that nature. The primary modes of travel for commuting trips, so during the AM and PM peak hours from this development are going to be Transit uh, being the single largest one, uh, given its proximity to the uh, Gladstone Trinity Line station. Uh, the um, actual the, the impact of vehicle traffic on the adjacent uh, network is anticipated to be very minimal. Uh, in terms of other developments, we look at development applications and we consult with city staff to make sure that we've covered everything uh, that is relevant and is that, a, that is available at the time that we create our study. Uh, those two being among them. And, and, and others as well. Thank you. Probably a city question. Is there scheduled maintenance updated for the sewer system running along Loretta? Is the new, sorry, I read the question wrong. Let me start again. There is scheduled maintenance updated for the sewer system running along Loretta. Is the new infrastructure being installed before or at the same time? I can probably jump in and then perhaps the city can, can follow. I am, uh, we are in contact with the 
uh, Loretta Rehabilitation Team, and we are coordinating plans and working with them. So the the hope is is that uh, that we can work together depending on what the timing is. They seem to be going a bit before us, but we're working through that now. Thanks, Jen. And yeah, just from the the city side, when this does occur, when we have a, a confirmed infrastructure project that's on the same frontage as a site development, that information should be contained within the applicant's um, site servicing stormwater management report as an awareness that this might be the current infrastructure, but there's plan for new infrastructure. And then depending on the timing of a site plan approval, we'd have to have a conversation with the developer about coordination um, with the main goal that if there's gonna be a city project putting in new infrastructure, a developer is not gonna come in months later and, and redo it all again. Uh, so that does get looked through this site plan application um, and more importantly, through conditions or post-approval discussions on the timing and coordination. Thank you. Will the development be completed in phases or all at once? I can take this one. So right now uh, we have it planned for two phases um, with the first one, as I mentioned, starting in March, 2023. Again, if all stars aligned, I always feel like I need to caveat it with that because um, you know, planning processes do take time. Um, there is no estimated sort of timing for the phase two though. Um, and as soon as we do, we would certainly let Councilor Leaper's office know. Uh, usually at some point in this meeting, I speak to this and it just seems like as good as time as any. As part of the site plan approval, our office will be putting in a special condition for a pre-construction meeting. And for this one, since it's such a large uh, site plan, we'll word it so that we have pre-construction meetings ahead of either phase of, of the project. So that meeting will happen with the community when they are very close to moving forward with construction. And at that time, we'll be able to have uh, a more nuanced discussion about the, the construction phasing and impacts and, and um, high level um, timelines that they're, they're hoping to work to, towards understanding. Of course, sometimes snags, snags come up, as well as disseminating contact information uh, to the key folks in the community who are close by, uh, should there be concerns on site. So just mentioning that because that will be kind of the, the next thing that you look for post-approval, that will be your signal that uh, construction is starting to move forward. And like I said, because it's a large project, we'll, we'll just wear the conditions so that they, they do those meetings ahead of uh, either phase. Okay. Originally, no traffic lights were projected at the corners of Loretta and Gladstone and Laurel and Breeze Hill in front of Devonshire. Has this changed? So I can't speak to, I'm not sure what they mean by originally. I, I believe they are likely referring to the zoning bylaw uh, um, amendment that would, would have been uh, supported by a traffic study that we also prepared. Uh, the, the recommendations of the uh, updated traffic study are essentially the same uh, and we're not proposing uh, signals at any of those locations. Uh, this development doesn't trigger any new uh, signal infrastructure. Thank you. I might have seen another question that was similar. So I can't find it right now, but there may be another similar question. Um, okay, I think we've already answered this. If all goes well with phase one, when would phase two begin? We've spoken to that. Uh, when will CLV begin kicking current tenants out prior to demolition? Um, so once we have our plans all approved and everything, like I said, March 2023 is when we're anticipating. Well, as per like any legal notices, we are required to notify our tenants well in advance of that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the timing is probably, but it's it's ample notice. I know this for sure. We we will be providing that. Um, and certainly the um, artists, as again mentioned, is part of the uh, Section 37 offering. We will be relocating them um, and then they will be relocating back into the standard drive building as well. Sorry, I was muted. Question for the city. In your opinion, uh, how well will this development complement what is being developed on the other side of the tracks? To be clear, how do we avoid a good and bad side of the tracks scenario? We want a good community feel to happen where both sides complement each other. Excellent question. So um, basically with the new Corso Italia secondary plan, which is very 
freshly approved by council, that essentially serves as the main policy document driving the vision for this area. And every planning application that comes into us now, whether it's a zoning amendment or site plan, official plan amendment, you name it, a planning application, that's gonna be our, our first go-to in terms of, of a policy framework as part of application review. So the same, so both sides of the track, so to speak, are captured by that secondary plan. And there's a lot of good direction in there in terms of active frontages, uh, connectivity, built form design, such as podium heights, materiality. So I feel like the secondary plan that was recently approved provides the guidance for how that complementary aspect happens. We'll review it on an application in a case-by-case -case basis, but I think that framework sets it up well for a complementary environment. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm looking at that question. Uh, good side, bad side. Um, I, I just wanna say, and uh, I, I'm, I'm reasonably, a certain Alex might want to add in as well. The the Gladstone Village is uh, is a really exciting concept with um, school parks, um, uh, like the the really large uh, community space that's been in there. It'll be a mixed use development, so OCH is going to have a number of developments in there. Uh, I think Salas has said, or not sorry, not Salas. Um, uh, the artist, I'm forgetting, Pal. I believe is uh, is getting some space in there, um, so it's it's really exciting. I I, I don't see a, a huge mismatch between what's going on uh, in Catherine's side and uh, and here. And then of course, if we can get that Laurel Bridge connected to help people get over to the big new park um, uh, on the other side, that would be amazing. I've just brought Alex in from Councillor McKenney's office if she wants to speak to this a little bit. Yeah, I think I would just echo what what Councillor said. It's going to be pretty similar to what's happening on this side of the tracks. Um, really exciting mixed use development with tons of new residential and and uh, and yeah, I don't think there'll be a good side versus bad side. It's going to be a good side and good side working together for sure. Amazingly put. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Um, can you speak to the mix of condo versus rental units? Sure. So towers one and two, which I know I'm sorry, Scott, if you do want to bring up the plan, um, just so we can visually see that. So towers one and two are to be rental buildings. Um, and then tower three is slated for condo. We'll just wait for that to come up. So yes, so you'll see tower one and two and tower three will be the condo. Thank you. Uh, when is the Laurel to Laurel Bridge expected to be developed? I think we spoke to that already. Yep. Yeah, the answer is we don't know. TBD. Uh, parking. Will there be accessible double wide parking spots? Will there be any visitor or share vehicle parking? I can speak to this, although I know Todd probably can speak to some of it as well, but yes. the. Per the city's guidelines and the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, uh, accessible spaces will be provided. Uh, those will be both at grade and underground, I believe. Todd, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's both at grade and underground accessible spaces. Um, we would, the, the primary amount of accessible spaces would be underground, but there is a, a small amount of parking at grade, very little parking at grade, and I believe we would be providing accessible spaces as as required uh, by bylaw. But uh, that that's a refinement that that's yet to come on the site plan. Right, and uh, speaking to visitor parking, there will also be visitor parking on site. Uh, yeah. Per the, um, I believe this is. Sorry, correct me if I'm wrong again. I believe the visitor parking is per the bylaw, uh, or it's at least. Um, representative of what we think the site will require. It's it's per the bylaw for visitor parking. Yep. And then, uh, Josie, we spoke earlier about the potential for uh, car share spaces. I know CLV works with the car share provider and that this is a candidate building for that as well, but that is depending dependent on their uh, agreement. It's, it's 
it's something that is beneficial to the site, but it's not in, within our control to force them to do it. Well, absolutely, we'd be looking at all those sorts of options. Thank you. Um, the new official plan, uh, sorry, uh, Fiona had to step away for a moment. The new official plan is looking at inclusionary zoning near transit stations. Will you have a proportion of the residential units in this development affordable in the true sense of affordable rents? And by that, I mean, we often talk about um, affordable market rents, uh, but then we also have deeply affordable rents that are available to people who can um, not afford market rent housing. We can just take this, yeah. So um, as I mentioned, the development is going to include a mix of um, condo and uh, rental, so ownership and rental, um, and a wide range of unit sizes and types. So thus, that's certainly going to be providing a level of affordable options in there. Um, and then I, I do know that the uh, ward um, does have funds for affordable housing, so I'm not exactly sure if any of those, or we certainly will have some conversations um, with the city, but right now that's sort of um, the level of affordability that we're looking to have here. Uh, are you looking at taking advantage of the CMHC program? We haven't had any of those conversations yet, so um, we certainly will, you know, it's still at a very preliminary stage. I know that's not always the desired answer to hear, but it is, yep. so <laughs> as soon as we have more information, we'll be uh, providing that forward, but uh, right now that's where we're at. Okay, I, I know I can speak for um, a lot of the people on the call uh, as, as more and more of the developments like this go in. Um, Hinsonburg is, is gentrifying far too quickly um, and we are all really concerned about uh, displacement. In this instance, there's no housing that's being displaced, but we really want to try to make sure that the neighborhood maintains as much uh, inclusivity as possible in, in the, the face of, um, uh, in the face of um, gentrification. Um, with all the new residents in this neighborhood, the traffic impact assessment says at section 6.3 that no improvements are recommended for the Loretta and Gladstone intersection. How is that possible? So I'll take this one as it's a direct question about our work. So we take, as I stated earlier, we take into account the traffic that is generated by the other uh, develop developments in the area. And that's based on the traffic impact assessments that those uh, proponents have put forward. We layer all of that together and combine it with existing traffic. Uh, those, those counts uh, for those intersections were relatively recent. They're uh, 2017, 2018. So prior to any impact of uh, COVID restrictions. We then adjust those uh, based on the other studies in the area, as well as a percent increase to account for things happening beyond the area. Um, and we, uh, we take that and run it through our software that tells us how much uh, delay is going to increase, how much capacity there is for those new cars, and what type of intersection control is required. So the existing intersection control has enough capacity to accommodate the, the traffic that is anticipated to be develop, uh, generated by the proposed developments. Now, I, I understand that, again, coming back to the 500 parking stalls for, versus the number of uh, actual vehicle trips, the, the mode share targets that we use are based on uh, both captured data for the city of Ottawa, as well as the target mode shares uh, that are set out for TOD areas. Uh, so those give us the, the number of trips that we should be assigning to vehicles versus people or versus transit. And in this case, given that we are directly adjacent to an LRT station, it's anticipated that most people who are choosing to live in this area will utilize that facility. Uh, and that limits the number of vehicle trips that we anticipate being generated by, uh, by this development. So you, combining all of those things, that's how we get to uh, the statement that no improvements are, are recommended for the Loretta and Gladstone intersection. So. Mark, I, it's, I haven't taken a close look at the CIA. Did you say that you're anticipated to have around 130 vehicle trips in AM peak? Uh, AM, Roughly, yeah, 130 is roughly the, the AM and PM, roughly 130. And is that over two hours of peak? So um, seven or 65 per hour? Or is that uh, no, a per hour number? That, that's a per hour number, but it's two way. So some of those will be coming, some of those will be going. Um, I think roughly it's 50-50. It's I think it, in the AM, you have a 
few more people leaving than arriving. Uh, there is some commercial and retail here, so it, it balances out to about 50-50. Um, and then in the PM, you would have a similar effect, you know, slightly more people returning because of the res residential component, but it would be pretty close to 50-50. So you're talking about uh, 65 trips leaving this development and 65 trips entering this development during the AM and PM uh, peak hour. Yeah. So, so you've got, and then 65 trips, uh, so that's, you know, a little over a car a minute who are trying to use, if everyone were using the Breeze Hill intersection as opposed to going, or sorry, the Loretta Gladstone intersection as opposed to going north, uh, it would be a little over a car a minute. And then for every car that's going north instead, uh, it's a car every um, uh, less often than that. Precisely, precisely. And for, for some uh, context, the the existing volumes through uh, the, the Loretta Gladstone intersection, uh, there are about uh, 800 vehicles combined, you know, across all approaches that are going through that intersection in the PM peak hour uh, and about four to 500 uh, in the AM. So really the, the amount of traffic that, that this development is adding is a very minor poor amount of the traffic that's actually moving through that intersection. Uh, on a given day. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, uh, maybe I can ask uh, Allison or Andrew quickly, and I'm sorry, I don't want to take over, but um, it seems uh, apropos. Uh, the Buchanan lighting property, does it, I, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the zoning that is there, it would presumably uh, allow for another tower or two of roughly the same height as you start to move closer to the, uh, to the Queensway? Or sorry, to um, uh, Somerset. Uh, from a zoning perspective, Councillor, I think it has the same current zoning as this property, which is that in industrial zoning with the height limit of what is it, eleven meters. Um, so it would have to go through the same type of planning application if it wanted to open up any further height and density relative to the secondary plan. Okay, like I'm just I'm presuming that they could get additional height and density. Um, and that, uh, you know, that would probably generate uh, probably another 40 cars an hour who might be trying to use the Gladstone Loretta intersection somewhere around that number. So um, yeah, it adds I up. I believe that property is included within uh, the secondary plan. I can't recall the site allocation, but um, it's, I believe it is part of that direction. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, Fiona. No worries. Okay. Um, just checking in. It's eight thirty-two. I have sixteen questions left in the queue, so we'll we'll try to conclude at eight forty-five. If if there's still some burning questions, we'll go to nine, and then that will be um, the time that we conclude. Um, okay. How do you determine the number of artist studios, rental rates, and who gets priority to rent them when there are hundred plus artists affected by this development? Uh, so currently, um, we're working on bringing the artists back to the standard bread building with rearrangements. There may be additional space. So if there are other artists that are located in other buildings on the property, um, we encourage them to reach out to the property manager um, to start those discussions. Thank you. Uh, what would be the earliest move-in date for any residential unit and or artist studio? So just based off uh, sort of the regular construction time. So if we start somewhere in March, 2023, um, typically takes about two years for construction. So we're looking at potentially somewhere in around March, uh, 2025. And again, that's just really assuming everything goes according to plan. Thank you. Uh, a quick comment. Overall, this looks like Toronto downtown plunked into one single block of Hintonburg. Uh, there, I have some back-to-back -back comments about parking. Uh, 570 vehicle spaces for just uh, 750 residential units is a very high number for a building being built at an LRT station. So do you want me to jump in here or do you want to read the other one? No, first? no, you. I have to find the other one. Please jump in. Sure. Yeah. So the the thing to keep in mind is that this is not just a uh, residential complex. There are other uses as well on the site, and the parking has been broken down 
uh, based on use. So I, quote, I quoted the overall number earlier, uh, but it would be, so we're providing uh, based on uh, the, the ratios, it would be 0.5 uh, residential parking spaces per unit, uh, which works out to about 420 uh, you, uh, just for the, um, the residential. So that rate for comparison, if you were outside of an LRT area, typical rates are 1 to 1.2 to 1.5 for a uh, per, parking spaces per unit. So that's a, a reduction of uh, a half to a, a third, basically, of the number of parking stalls that you would see elsewhere uh, outside of an LRT uh, TOD area. Uh, the remaining um, uh, parking stalls are related to the office and the live work, as well as the retail. So I think that also actually answers a, a question later on that was asking whether parking is provided for those other uses. And the answer to that is yes. So it's a combination of the, the various uses that get to that number. So that's that's the other thing to consider in that, uh, that traffic piece as it relates to the parking is that not all of those parking spaces are uh, residents. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, so the I found the other comment, it's exactly the same, but seems like quite a lot of parking for sites so close to LRT and the MUP. And then on uh, what you just said, um, uh, are any of the parking spaces for commercial slash office use? And then there's another question: How much of how much public parking is to be provided for the commercial and retail space? Do you have those numbers at all? Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, 100, uh, roughly 100 spaces for the office and live work, uh, 16 for the retail component, and then there are 30 visitor parking spaces on top of that. And the the bicycle parking is similarly broken down. There's 422 bicycle parking for the residential component and then 80 uh, allocated for the office retail and live work components that will, uh, the, the resident uh, bicycle parking uh, would actually, would obviously be um, the, the more secure spaces and the office retail, basically the visitor bike parking is gonna be more publicly accessible. Okay, thank you. Um, and another parking question you may wanna comment on, I am not very clear how you can predict individuals' uses of cars. Do they sign a waiver saying they'll only use their car on weekends and for ski trips? So no, there's no you know, legal requirement for people to uh, use their cars in any specific way. Uh, however, as I stated before, we're greatly reducing the amount of parking that is provided for a building of this size when compared to uh, you know, a non-TOD area. Uh, the, the idea behind that is, is the, a reduction in parking will encourage people to use uh, transit and LRT. I would also say that people who are looking to live in this kind of a, a tower, in this kind of a community, in this way, are going to be drawn to these transit facilities. So they're, they are you know, planning their lives around having good access to transit, a walkable community, the ability to, to live and work without a car. And so that is, you know, sort of builds us towards uh, some level of confidence that this is how this building is going to operate when we, uh, when, when it opens. Thank you. Um, a quick comment for Jeff. Um, the, the person will reach out to you about their comment regarding the city managing the rental space rental of the spaces under their currently existing program. That'd be great. Yeah, Thank you. I've, I've been having some other chats about that uh, while, while this has been going on. And I've got a really high interest, uh, a really high level of interest in that. So please do. OK, and, a, and another question for the councillor. Can I rephrase the question above? Does the councillor have confidence that residents in, in this building will be using their cars primarily for leisure activities and that surrounding streets can handle the high volume of cars being introduced into the neighborhood? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, yes. So, you know, I live near the uh, 18 story or uh, whatever it is at uh, at Rosemount and, and nothing comes out of that parking garage at peak, right? People don't move into that building um, to drive to their office jobs downtown uh, when they are so well served by transit. Um, it is a lot of cars that sit in the parking garage, but you don't actually see them leaving 
that often. And, you know, this is a discussion that Mikhail and I uh, fight about a fair bit uh, with Foten is the, the developers want to have lots of parking for um, people who have cars because they believe that people, even if they're not using them, want the parking spot. And a, a building is um, less marketable if there's no place to store the car. But what we are both agreed on, and I, I believe that if you if you have the cars there, it makes it more likely that they will use them. I'm forever pushing to have less parking in buildings uh, versus what the developers are looking for. But I think something that we both agree on is that even if there are a whack of cars in the parking garage, in a location like this that is as well served by transit um, as it is, um, it's it's we're not going to see massive lines of traffic leaving this building in the morning. Uh, I was just uh, chatting with another resident uh, about, okay, so when the Buchanan lighting and then the print shop and Happy Goat, when they go to 18 stories each, then we're going to start looking at maybe 200 cars an hour in the peak hour who are trying to leave uh, to get onto Gladstone at Loretta. And at some point, it will be uh, so many cars who are trying to get out there that the city will have to look at putting a traffic light in because people will start making bad choices and, and cars will start smashing into each other. But the level of traffic that I would expect to see coming out of this building during the peak heavy hour is going to be relatively minimal. That Rosemount building, um, you know, nothing comes out of it. And I'm, I'm talking pre-pandemic. Um, if you go down to uh, Richmond Road and, you know, the we've talked a lot it comes up in every development meeting the uh, the convent building you know very few cars come out of that parking garage um at patricia it's yes people have the cars and and many people want to have a car with them but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're using them very much i'm one of those people i've got a car it sits in my driveway but when it comes to um when i want my car i want it you know, I'm, I'm not yet willing to abandon my car and subscribe to Virtue Car and Uber, et cetera, even though I know it makes more economic sense for somebody like me. But the, I do not believe that this building is going to result in some new crush of cars on the street. 20 years from now, I think we will end up having to take a look at traffic measures like traffic lights at Loretta as more and more traffic is coming down. But this building... Um, I don't believe is going to be the start of any of that. Um, sorry, I, I, I tend to talk a little bit too much when people ask me these questions. Um, and then there was another second part of that. Can you just reread the question, please, Fiona? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Does the councillor have confidence that residents in this building will be using their cars primarily for leisure activities and that surrounding streets can handle the high volume of cars being introduced into the neighbourhood? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I do. I, I've been trying to figure out, like, why would people be on Breeze Hill? Um, unless this building attracts um, 400 people who work at Bayview Yards and and all drive to work, uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing a, a huge increased demand on Breeze Hill, um, which is obviously one of my key concerns because that's where the school is. Um, so, yeah, no, I am, I am confident. I would not oppose this building on the basis of a traffic impact. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so both sides are going to be good and this block can be fully built up because Laurel to Laurel Ped Bridge will be enabling all the people to go over to the park. Shouldn't there be more uh, of an amenity, including green space to be provided on site? Uh, for example, not plan with this much density. someone want to speak to that? Maybe a note on just the amenity space requirements um, uh, in terms of for the residents. Uh, we, we meet all those requirements through both the pops and through the uh, terraces that we've shown on the rooftops of the podiums in addition to private balconies. So in terms of the, the base requirement of amenity, uh, we're uh, in places in excess of the requirement and we're not uh, seeking that the zoning amendment will reduce the amenity requirement. Okay, thank you. Uh, is any street parking being added along nearby streets? 
No, all parking that is related to the site will take place on the site. Thank you. Uh, what will you do if you can't lease or sell the parking you build? Um, if that uh, ends up being the case, we'll definitely look at repurposing some of the underground parking, um, typically become storage or, you know, other amenity areas, um, but it's not something we're anticipating at this point. Perhaps we can even look at providing public parking or something like that. Okay. I have two quick questions about the Buchanan property. Um, okay, let's see. Is the property directly adjacent to the north of the project also slated for development? I believe the city planner just mentioned that the Buchanan Lighting property is included in the secondary plan. And the second question is, can the city take the private property of Buchanan Lighting? We could purchase that land. There is nothing to stop the city from doing so, but we have to acquire it at uh, fair market value. And uh, I, see, I see very little um, pathway to the city expending the money to acquire it. Not that it's not a good idea. Um, one of the, I think one of the, the difficult conversations the city is having right now in the course of doing its official plan is that we are looking at intensifying neighborhoods and areas like this that are close to LRT. And we are recognizing that we need green space. The, and I think that there is a recognition that that's going to be a massive challenge because in order to acquire green space, we have to buy those properties. And, and that is an expensive proposition. Um, the, challenge for the city is to figure out how we're going to fund with the mechanisms that are out there the acquisition of a large amount of green space for uh, the intensifying neighborhoods like Hintonburg. That's, that's simply a challenge. But politically speaking, what I would say today is that it's highly unlikely that this city council uh, would acquire that property. Um, and I would say it would be a very, very long time before something like, um, if we identified it as a property we wanted to buy in a plan, like the secondary plan, we could then eventually change our development charges bylaw to begin acquiring the funds in order to do that. But that is a really rocky path forward. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to hold out hope to residents today that that is realistic. I see uh, Andrew's got his mic off, uh, so. Feel free to counter me on that one, Andrew. No, thanks, Councillor. I was just going to add to it for clarity that there are no planning applications before the city at this moment can, can um, with the respect to that property being Buchanan Lighting 127 Loretta. Um, it was captured within the Corso Italia secondary plan, which provides for policy direction, but there's no planning applications before us at this time, and there's, there's none that I'm aware of that are, are pending. Secondary plans, uh, for those who may not know them, are, are big area-wide plans that anticipate, here's where we're going to put tall buildings, here's where we're going to keep buildings low, here's where we're going to have commercial, here's where we're going to have a park. Um, and I, uh, I don't know, uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean if it has, um, uh, you know, a, a new height anticipated that there is an immediate uh, plan to develop it. But I also see Miguel... Well, just, you it, do you have a client who's uh, who owns that and is preparing to develop it? No, no, but I can I can tell you that through the secondary plan process, the city determined that an 18 story building would be appropriate on that site. And given that that's a high rise tower, part of the burden on CLV was to make sure that there was adequate tower separation to that future building in the event that it it redevelops. But I I'm, I'm not working on behalf of anybody now. Okay, it would make an amazing park. Uh, and a beautiful compliment to what's going on on the other side of the tracks uh, and, and much needed. It's just, it would be a huge challenge to try to get all the, the dominoes to fall in order. Yeah. But you know, the, the secondary plan is that mechanism that the city assesses whether they want to purchase lands or identify lands for, for public uses. And, you know, Kevin Weary's group, which is the parks department had a very active role in this in terms of, 
identifying those lands through that secondary plan process. So, yeah, the the big win from the secondary plan was the um, the land on the other side of the tracks, which thankfully will be um, uh, very accessible uh, to everybody on our side of the tracks. So, uh, that's uh, that's a nice new addition to green space in uh, in our neighborhood. And the city did purchase through that process 1050 Somerset to supplement those lands. So that's again how that how secondary plan takes effect. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have 10 minutes left and I have a whole slew of questions about the artist. So I'm gonna try and go through them in lumps rather than one off. So uh, CLV will be locating the artists, how and where, and then as a follow-up to that, why are the enriched bed artists being prioritized over other tenants who will be evicted as a result of this development? And on a similar note, uh, what will happen to Vimy Brewery? Uh, what is happening to accommodate current tenants in the impacted area? If they are, are they being provided an opportunity to relocate in the new development? If so, what about a temporary location during development? So there's a few more, but I'll, I'll start with those three. Okay, I see that Councillor Lieber wants to answer the two questions about... Uh, no, no, sorry. Oh, no, was... Okay. <laughs> Um, so with regard to existing tenants in the building, um, as I mentioned before, if there is an interest um, to relocate back into the development, I encourage them to reach out to the current property manager um, and they can get uh, you in touch with um, our leasing team for that. Um, and with regards to the artist, we'll be working with Councillor Leeper um, on how to um, uh, relocate them where and how we are providing funds in order to do that through our section 37 contribution. Okay, so on that note, there are two other comments. Why are the enrichment artists being prioritized over the other tenants who will be evicted as a result of this development? And it is concerning, baffling that the standard bread is going to be renovated into new studios and handed to private, private artist organizations. Isn't this an opportunity to do something new that is more accessible to all artists in Ottawa? Yeah, so I would just say to the second part of that question, I am really intrigued by the notion of having the um, the city uh, manage the space in some kind of um, arrangement with the owner. Um, I, I don't think the city can afford to purchase this building from the owner because um, obviously they're going to look for uh, for for market value. The um, Focus has been on the standard bread artists to this point uh, because that building is going to be renovated. Uh, it's a heritage building. It has a, a long history with um, with the artist community. Folks like Vimy um, have signed a lease with a landlord, and hard as is, is, is to say, they are subject to. Uh, all the usual protections that any commercial tenant has with any landlord when a landlord determines that they want to end the lease. Um, I have been encouraging the developer to uh, give some accommodation to Vimy, to try to relocate them back in the building, to help them with relocation costs. But these are all over and above the rights that a tenant has um, in, a, in, a, in an agreement with a landlord. And so we're starting from the rights that they have, which uh, you know are, are, are set out in the, the leases that they've signed and in the statutes that are set out by the province. And then I'm, I'm trying to use the benefits that the developer owes the public in return for getting greater density and height than the site is currently zoned for, that gives a certain defined amount of uh, money in order to try to accomplish something. And working within that envelope, my goal is to get um, as many artists back into the standard bread building for the least possible rent 
for the longest possible time. And it, we're, we're, we're working inside a, a box that has been fixed by the public benefits value that the developer owes to the city as set out in provincial law. Um, we are six minutes away from nine o'clock. Um, so this is a discussion I've had with a number of the artists in the building. And if you want to know more about how this discussion goes, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to my office and I am more than happy to um, spend some significant time chatting with you about you know, what this discussion is and what the potential outcomes are. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, it's five minutes to nine. Jeff, are there any questions in there that you wanted to make sure that we're reading out loud? Uh, one I think is important, um, uh, Tyler Buchanan is here. And so they've commented, will I be compelled to sell? What if I say no? So I thought that was important to note. And thank you for joining us, Tyler. Jeff, is there anything else? That's No, if, uh, if Tyler owns that property, does he want to sell it to the city for a buck? Because that's an offer I would take. Probably not. Um, no, uh, I think we've uh, we've largely covered it. Um, There's a comment about needing say. a needing a grocery store in the area, which is something we hear a lot of. Um, oh, so I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong list. Yeah, so one of the things with grocery stores, the city can zone for grocery stores. Um, we can't force them to go in. Uh, I think everyone kind of assumes that as these towers go in along the spine of the O train, um, that someone will put a grocery store in one of these properties somewhere. Um, grocery stores are kind of frustrating in that you cannot budge the big chains. Uh, they have their numbers. They're looking to, to, to make those numbers. And then when the numbers occur in whatever magic circles they're looking at in their, their black voodoo, it is, um, they, they jump and they, they try to get a, a grocery store in before anyone else does. Uh, but it seems to be, um, entirely independent of political pressure. Uh, they are responding uh, pretty much entirely to, uh, to market requirements. So we zone areas for grocery stores, uh, and then we hope that the market conditions are right to, um, to go in there. And I mean, we'd be certainly open to sort of looking for like an urban grocery store format in this um, location. Like that would be something that the developer is certainly um, willing to explore. Okay. Cool. I think yeah. we're good. Yep. I mean, sorry, just quickly. I may have just accidentally deleted or moved a question about 131 Loretta. I was just going to type that it's it's in the same camp as, as the Buchanan site. We have no planning applications before the city, but it is included within the Corso Italia secondary plan. Which that's not the city property. No, it's it's um it's along the road. It's right beside the Buchanan lighting. I can't remember the, the name. With Happy Goat in it? No, it's the uh, where the glass studio is, I think. Oh, okay. Loretta Studios, yes. So oh, okay. someone in the chat had put, what about 131 Loretta? I was going to answer that it's it's in the same camp. We have no planning applications, but it does have, it is included within the secondary plan for Corso Italia. Talk to your landlord and see if they have any plans, and I'd be interested in hearing if they do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, two minutes to nine. I think we are wrapped up. Um, Jeff, do you have any closing comments before we conclude? Uh, no, there's a, a number of really interesting changes to the podium um, that I paid close attention to for the first time this evening. Um, I think it has moved in some really uh, positive directions. Uh, I am interested in hearing from residents um, where there are tweaks that need to be made. I'm still largely supportive of this, uh, but if there are tweaks that I can talk to the uh, planners and the developer about, I'd, I'd love to hear about those. Um, and then the discussion with artists, uh, particularly um, uh, those in attendance this evening, uh, please uh, reach out and uh, and chat with me. Um, it's uh, we've had the sort of same discussion uh, multiple times now over the years. Uh, we are getting closer, I think, to the point where the developer wants to. Um, 
ask for the approval, uh, the rezoning. Uh, at that point, we need to have some sort of clarity as to what those arrangements are going to look like. Uh, and it's really important that I have the full universe of um, uh, what's being discussed and, and who's involved uh, in front of me before we finalize that. Thanks, Jeff. Someone's just asking what's the best way to reach out to you. So I am putting Jeff's email address in the chat. Uh, it's just, it's really simple. It's jeff.lieber at ottawa.ca. So thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, if any of your neighbors or fellow artists or fellow tenants or, or just interested folks miss this meeting, it will be on YouTube uh, next week because I'm on vacation tomorrow and, and until Friday. So I'm not doing it tomorrow, sorry. Um, but you can catch that recording. And as I said earlier, if you have any comments that you want to submit, make sure you're sending those to the city planners and CCing our office. And just quickly on behalf of um, the developer and the consultant team, we really do want to thank everybody for taking the time tonight to join us and listening in on the changes that we've made to the development proposal. We're certainly very excited to be uh, building in this neighborhood as you know, we're very invested in Ottawa and we do have a lot of projects. So uh, community feedback is certainly very important to us. Perfect. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, Thank everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks,